It is my pleasure to introduce Sarah Levin. Sarah is the Director of Grassroots and Community Programs at the Secular Coalition for America, SCA, a nonprofit advocacy organization based in Washington, D.C. that amplifies the political voice of non-theistic Americans and represents 19 national member organizations, including the Society for Humanistic Judaism. Since joining the Secular Coalition in 2013, she has managed and grown the Secular Coalition's state advocacy program and implemented various grassroots campaigns on a national and state level. In 2014, she led the Knit a Brick campaign to protest the Hobby Lobby versus Burwell decision, which allowed <laughs> which allowed closely held for-profit corporations to be exempt from a regulation religiously objected to by its owners. 1,600 knitted and crocheted bricks from activists within all 50 states and five countries were stitched together to build three large walls of separation which were marched from the Supreme Court to the Capitol <coughs> to demand action in Congress. In 2016, Sarah launched the SCA's political party organizing program, and the first ever secular caucus was established at the Texas Democratic Convention. At the convention, three secular policy resolutions were incorporated into the Texas Democratic Party platform. Since then, the SCA has helped to establish secular caucuses in Arizona and Nebraska state democratic parties and in the National Libertarian Party. You might be interested in listening to episode number 203 of the Friendly Atheist podcast, where Sarah discusses the importance of defending the Johnson Amendment, which Sheila mentioned last night, which prevents all charities, including religious institutions, from using tax-deductible contributions for partisan electioneering. Her TED Talk, entitled, Lead with Feelings, Not Facts, How to Talk Secular Values, stresses why it's important to lead with your values when advocating for change, and it discusses strategies to articulate those values in an authentic, compelling way. Sarah is committed to getting atheists, agnostics, humanists, and other non-theists a seat at the table in public policy and empowering them to be effective advocates for the separation of church and state. Please welcome Sarah Levin to lead us in a workshop entitled A Guide to Grassroots Organizing for Secular Political. Thank you for coming. Um, I've, I've been wanting to come to a, a SHJ event for a really long time. I, I mean, my name is Sarah Loving. You might have guessed I'm a secular Jew myself. So I feel very, very at home. Um, yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, so my first question is before today, raise your hand if you had heard of the Secular Coalition for America. That's great, that's actually most of you, but there's a few of you who didn't raise your hands. Um, so I'm actually gonna play a short video that I, gets me pumped up every time, but it gives you a, an idea. It's about our lobby day, but it really tells you more about who we are and what the Secular Coalition for America does. Now more than any time I can ever remember, we need people engaged because the stakes have never been higher. Thank you all for being here tonight. This year marks the 15th year anniversary of the Secular Coalition for America. In the beginning, we were working just to be able to hire one lobbyist because we were all volunteers. Each year, we continue to grow. I see a bright future for us. Today, we represent 18 national non-theistic organizations. We represent the largest religious demographic in the United States. Well, the United States of America is not a theocracy, and on our watch it never will be. We talk so often about our shared secular values. Those values include freedom, inclusion, equality, and knowledge. 
It's a uniquely wonderful thing when we have lawmakers who not only share those values, but they live those values. And a secular person has just as good a claim to understanding the truth as a person who is religious, correct? Well, I'm not sure. For the last five years that I've been a member of the State House, I am the only member in the Pennsylvania General Assembly that doesn't swear in on a book of faith. And the Secular Coalition is a, an organization that has supported legislators like me. We hope to see you all at Lobby Day tomorrow. The thing that makes me feel good about the work that I do is when I can meet with our supporters who come in for our lobby day. Good morning, everyone. We spend the morning really focusing on the issues that we care about. We have policy experts come in. I think it's great that the Secular Coalition of America is standing up for the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the secular principles advanced by our founders. The values and the mission of this group is something that I firmly believe in. We learn how to, to talk about the issues in ways that will make a difference on Capitol Hill. I just wanted to come and, and highlight the importance of your work, the importance of this organization. We also train people about what to expect during a meeting. Whether you have the opportunity to meet with a member of Congress, him or herself, or whether you meet with one of those individual staffers, take the time during your meeting to build that personal relationship. But I want to reiterate something that I said at the top of the morning, which is to have fun. We march to Capitol Hill. This is really just very exciting. This is what makes things tick. It's a moment that I want people to remember for the rest of their lives. As a citizen of the U.S., you have the right to speak to your representative. And just state what's important to you and your values. It is very important to talk with your legislators, let them know what your issues are. Uh, and so it's not just about turning back the tide, it's about creating a ripple that we won't be able to control. We're giving voice to a huge number of Americans who may not feel necessarily like anybody is speaking on their behalf. We can be the next powerhouse constituency. It's really important that we get out here and we talk to our representatives and let them know that we're here in our communities. We are a large, growing demographic, and that's why we need you to get out there and show your face. And going into the future, I feel really good about where our community can go because we'll be leading, not following, and not sitting on the sidelines. Yeah. And that clip with Paul Golan was not just edited in for this event. No, it's always been in there. It's always been in there. If any of you are ever coming to DC, if you give me two or three weeks notice, what I'd love to do is um, schedule meetings with your congressional offices. Uh, and I'll give you materials on what we're working on, prepare you, and we'll walk in together. I arranged a meeting for Paul, and he actually met with um, Representative Steve Cohen in person when he was in DC. So today, we're talking about building secular political clout, the path to a secular voting bloc. So I'm gonna be telling you a little bit about, you've just learned about the Secular Coalition for America, I'll tell you a little bit more about what we do. And my goal is by the end of this, you're gonna be so jazzed to get involved that you're gonna to wanna to go and rush to the clipboard and sign up and get involved in all the things that we do. So. I know a lot of you know us already, but our mission is to increase the visibility of and respect for non-theistic viewpoints in the United States and strengthen the secular character of our government as the best guarantee of freedom for all. I often get asked, and by the way, we work very closely with Americans United. I know Rachel mentioned that yesterday. I get asked a lot what the difference is between the two of us, and I think this is one of the most important things. It is written into our mission to represent non-theists. Part of my job isn't just advocating for separation of church and state and evidence in time space policy. It's educating congressional offices about all of you and about our member organizations, and about who non-theists are and what we aren't. If I know that, a, that there is a local secular community group in a district, I will mention it. So when I met, and we just did our 100-day pledge where we met with every freshman congressional office in the first 100 days of the new Congress. Why? Because they need to know who we are and who our constituency is, and that's part of our job. So when I met, for example, with Kansas, uh, uh, the third district of Kansas office, Representative Sharice Davids, I knew that Kansas Oasis was in that district, and so I made sure to talk to them about that. Why? 
visibility and respect of non-theists and because what, what I want them to do is realize that when they're planning the schedule for their boss to go out to the community and get their photo ops with the firefighters and the religious communities and whatever constituency groups they visit, shouldn't we be on that list? Yeah, we should, we should. And that's part of what we do in DC. But we need your help to build those relationships and that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit today. If you can't remember anything else about who we are, we're your lobbyists in Washington. You have federal lobbyists representing you in Congress and the White House. We actually were um, going to weekly events at the Office of Public Engagement with the White House under the Obama administration. We haven't been invited back with the new administration. Yeah, I don't know. So, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what's a better way to do this. I'd like to have it. Is there a clicker? Okay, yeah, sorry about that. So. Breaking down what we do, we do coalition building, lobbying, and grassroots advocacy. All of this comes back to our primary goal of representing you in Capitol Hill. So we are a coalition of 19 member organizations, right? We lead, convene, and facilitate cooperation among those organizations. So there's a lot of stuff that we do that you're not gonna see us talk about publicly, but I wanted the opportunity to talk to you about what's happening behind the scenes. When we were first founded, we were the only lobbyists in DC, and we could use 50 lobbyists in DC. Now, we're not the only organiza organization that has lobbyists. American Atheists, American Humanist Association, FFRF, Center for Inquiry, all have lobbyists now. And that's fantastic, because the things we're getting hit with every single day, we need to be working together and to have as many voices as possible. And so what we do is we convene what they call themselves the cabal, <laughs> of lobbyists and lawyers and we convene them monthly to make sure that we're sharing intel we're sharing uh, resources and we're working together and so that we can specialize you know who's leaning on this issue and how can we support you and uh, putting together all the sorts of materials and research that needs to be done to educate members of Congress and support the issues that we support and oppose um, the issues that we uh, oppose what our, our opposition is doing we also convene all of the executive directors, including Paul, uh, once a year for our annual members meeting to make sure that we're all on the same page about where the movement is going, um, give all of our members an update on what we're working on on their behalf, um, and again, sharing res resources and sharing ideas. The coalition, you know, all these member organizations, what brings them together is separation of church and state. You know, they all organize themselves very differently. Um, you have you know, the, you have the congregational model here, but then you have the humanists and the atheists who maybe meet in the bar or meet in the library once a month. You've got ex-Muslims and the way they organize is completely different. But this is the thing that brings us all together. We, we already talked about how we lobby Capitol Hill and the White House, and what I'm gonna focus on for this presentation mostly is grassroots advocacy. We don't have local secular community groups. I get asked that a lot. Oh, when's the next time I can meet at my local secular coalition? That's not what we do because our member organizations do that. You are the communities. Our job is to mobilize the communities that our member organizations are building to be effective advocates. We train, empower, and mobilize secular constituents to make their voices heard. I can talk to your member of Congress and their staff until I'm blue in the face and tell them about the, the incredible numbers that the religiously unaffiliated are the largest, fastest demographic, uh, growing demographic in the country. They don't care if they've never heard from secular constituents in their district. Why? Because they're always thinking about the next election. They're always thinking about how do I get reelected? And who's gonna reelect them? The people who show up. There's, so, there's a really, really dangerous assumption that I've heard repeated over and over, which is, well, the country's just gonna become more secular because all of these people, you know, the religiously unaffiliated are growing and young people are, are secular, so the policies will just eventually reflect that because, you know, look at the numbers. That's not true. Can you maybe think of a few issues right now where the majority of Americans are over here, but the policy is over here? Oh, yeah. yeah. Only, one, only one big one. <laughs> <laughs> I think quite a few, quite a few. And, and so we, we can't just, that's a great opportunity, but, it, but it's not a guarantee. And so we have to take advantage of this growing demographic, but also mobilize that demographic. Okay, great. These are all our voting member organizations. You can go to the next one. I'm gonna kind of rush through this first half. Um, this, I just wanted to show you a picture. These are all our member organization executive directors together. Um, you can go to the next one. Yes. I actually like the next picture with the banner, but I, I'm laughing like a crazy person, so I want you to see me normal first before you saw this one. 
And then this is, this is the members meeting in action. Where, what we're doing here is actually having our executives map their programs. And all this, we, we called them um, spheres of influence. We had all these big post-its. This one says military, this one says business, um, that one says media, we had one for schools. And they were mapping out where each organization, what sphere they are organizing in so we could see the overlap and find opportunities. Oh, you're working in this sphere. How can we work together on this? And also where we're not. Do you see how empty that business is? One is, so we had a very productive conversation about what is the secular community doing to engage businesses. That's gonna be very important because that was huge for the LGBT community. Look at Georgia, for example. Both chambers had passed a, a religious freedom bill that would have just allowed individuals, nonprofits, including those getting state funding, to discriminate on the basis of religion. The governor vetoed it, why? Not because he supports religious freedom the way we envision it, but because there were big businesses that were threatening to pull out. And he didn't want to end up like uh, North Carolina, which lost a lot of money for passing a discriminatory bill. And so getting businesses on our side is going to be very important. And then on the right, you see we have a panel of our lawyers. We also had a panel of our lobbyists. So just know, um, I'm sharing this with you, because you're not going to see this you know, publicly as much. But just know that this is a huge, hugely important thing that we do that we facilitate the cooperation among our member organizations, not just at the executive level and among the lobbyists and lawyers, but actually last year we started two working groups, one with all the communication staffers and one with all the grassroots staffers, the people who do what I do across all of these organizations. Sheila is on those calls representing Society for Humanistic Judaism. Believe it or not, before those working groups, a lot of them didn't know who Sheila was. A lot of them didn't know each other. And how are we going to be stronger as a movement if our staff, who are working on the same things, don't know each other? And so the coalition stepped in to make sure that we have those connections. And some great joint projects have come out of that, including the Secular Week of Action, which just started yesterday. And that is something that is, uh, participate, uh, all of our member organizations are participating in. We have all of their local affiliates signing up to do all kinds of actions, social, charitable, and political, because together we decided we want to change the narrative around the National Day of Prayer and contrast prayer with action. Uh, one more project I'll share, with, I'll share, give you two more stories to give you an example of this and we'll move on. I want to give you an example of what facilitating lobbyists and lawyers means in real time. So in, when any administration wants you to miss something, they drop it on a Friday, especially if it's a three-day weekend. So what happened, um, not last year, I think it was 20, might have been 2017 in October, the weekend, the Columbus Day weekend, the Friday before, there were two big bombs dropped by the administration. One was a new health and human services rule that would make it harder uh, to access birth control. And one was uh, a memorandum issued by the Department of Justice on religious liberty. And that memorandum, and, and the memorandum was instructing all of the executive agencies to interpret religious freedom in the most extreme way possible in their rulemaking and implementation of, of laws. All of the media and most of the big groups, including ACLU, were looking at the birth control rule. Nobody was talking about this memorandum. And this memorandum was like if the religious right had written a, a letter to Santa and, you know, with all the things they want, they got all of it. Including, of course, you know, restricting access to reproductive health care. But it was everything you could possibly imagine. Johnson Amendment was in there, everything. Well, about a week and a half after that, Attorney General Sessions was going to have his first public hearing in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee. And if you think back to that time, there was so much that had happened. There were so many things that senators were going to be asking him about. There was DACA, there was gun control, there was drug policy. And you know, at these hearings, as a lobbying group, what you want is for them to ask the official a question about something that is a priority for you. Because you know, all the you know, national news have their focus. People are watching this. It's a great way to get visibility on the issue and to get the official on the record on the issue. So that we were competing with a lot of interests to try, but our goal was to get at least one senator on the committee to ask a question about this memorandum of the Attorney General. But we only had about a week and a half to do it, and it got dropped on a Friday. So what do you do? We had to do a few things. First of all, we had to set up meetings with all of, the, all of our allies on the Senate Judiciary Committee and their staff to inform them about the memorandum, give them a list of questions that we would suggest them asking. So someone had to set up those meetings. Someone had to do the analysis 
of the actual memorandum and digest it because you can't just hand them this stuff. You know, they have so many things going on. And a big part of lobbying is basically just taking big ideas and making them into one or two page and handing them to staff so that it's really, really, really easy, point by point. And drafting the questions. In only about a week and a half, if only one organization was working alone, this would have been nearly impossible to do. But because we have this group of lobbyists and lawyers that we could spring into action, even though most of us had off that Monday, we got on a call, we said, who's doing what? You're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing this, go. And we got all of that done together. Not one, but three senators asked Attorney General Sessions about the memorandum. In fact, Senator Hirona from Hawaii used our question verbatim. We were watching the hearing, and I jumped down to my seat. I was like, that's our question! <laughs> And I can share this with you here, but we don't share these things publicly generally. Why? Because, you know, this, that, that's not strategic lobbying. You know, you, you, these are things that happen behind the scenes. But we're doing it on your behalf. And we're doing it together by combining our resources. So um, I'll take questions at the end. Okay. Okay. Next. Will you remind people what the Johnson Amendment Yes, the Johnson Amendment um, is part of the IRS code. Um, it, prohibits all 501c3s, including houses of worship, from endorsing or opposing candidates for office um, and electioneering, giving, giving campaigns money. And C3s are the, 501c3s are the nonprofits that when you give them money, it's tax deductible. Okay, and then this is a picture at, at our annual members meeting. We also uh, did a mini lobby day for all the executive directors um, and brought them to the Hill. It's, it's, you can't really see, but Paul was there as well. Right, that's Jamie Raskin. Lower right and yeah. Paul's on the far mm -hmm. left. Yeah. Oh, really quick, who's heard of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus? Yeah. Yes. Okay, a lot of you haven't. This is really exciting. So, at our lobby day um, and our awards dinner last year, Congressman Huffman from California announced the uh, establishment of a Congressional Free Thought Caucus that specifically, if you look at their mission statement, not only supports separation of church and state, but is talking about defending the rights of non theists. Now, so, for those of you who don't know what a Congressional Caucus is, uh, members of Congress form these sort of interest groups around any number of issues. It might be an agricultural caucus, it might be a border state caucus, it might be, I mean, there's a caucus for almost everything, um, both for issues, for, for ethnicities, there's a congressional black caucus, um, and it's a really a springboard for legislation, for them to come, or come and decide, okay, this is what our common purpose is, what are we gonna do about it together as members of Congress? It also becomes a direct channel of communication for outside groups and lobbying organizations and nonprofits who share that interest to work with them directly. And it makes it a lot easier to um, introduce proactive legislation and those sorts of things than, you know, traditionally we're just going from one office to another and trying to get them to coordinate with each other. They're, they're self-organizing for a specific purpose. So there, of course, is a Congressional Prayer Caucus as well. But now we have our own caucus, a Congressional Free Thought Caucus. And this is really a huge deal. I can't really overstate it. Um, we have a direct, we have a group of members of Congress who we are working with directly to not just defend against bad legislation, but now actually introduce good legislation. One of the things we're working on right now is trying to get a uh, appropriations request in, working with the Senate side, to expand access to evidence-based addiction recovery programs like Smart Recovery and Life Ring. Right now, most, most people, when they're in a situation where they need addiction recovery or they're mandated by the government, by a drug court or by the military to attend one, the only options are AA or 12-step, which are pervasively religious. This is an issue where the courts have actually been on our side. Every time someone has sued on it, we have won. But even though you have this established constitutional right to a secular alternative, if there is no alternative available, what do you do? And so we're trying to solve that problem. It's a fantastic issue because it is bipartisan. It really is a life or death situation. Expanding access to these programs that work, that are evidence-based, is going to save lives. Um, and it's just a fantastic issue to, to, um, to work on. Go ahead. All right. Oh, this is just an example of, uh, remember that memorandum I told you about? Um, this, is, this is part of it. Um, I'm not gonna read it out to you, but it basically means um, that nonprofits or contractors that are working with the government have an entitlement to, to, to that money, even if they're discriminating on the basis of religion. That, that was part of the memorandum. You can go to the next one. This is, this is my favorite. RIFRA, which is the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, this was the basis of the Hobby Lobby decision. 
RIFRA does not permit the federal government to second guess the reasonableness of a religious belief. This was in that memorandum that almost no media was talking about, but our, our community sprung to action on. I'll go to the next one, just to give you an example of, it, it's much longer than that. Okay, so now this is the crux of, of, of what we're here to talk about today, which is mobilizing constituents. So I mentioned before, the degree to which I can really bend the ear of an office when I walk into their office is how many constituents they've heard from. So all of our grassroots programs go back into our lobbying mission to make sure that our constituency is visible, um, that it's powerful. We need you to be building those relationships as well. Go ahead. So we already know that the religiously unaffiliated are the largest, fastest growing demographic in the country. Go ahead. I'm gonna skip through this a little bit. We know that more young adults, now one in three, are unaffiliated. Go ahead, sorry. So my question to you is, if the religiously unaffiliated are the largest, fastest growing demographic in the country, why don't we have more political influence? Because we're not loud enough. We're not loud enough? We don't vote? We don't vote. Organized. We're not organized? Because not all religiously unaffiliated people are secular. Not all religiously unaffiliated people are secular. We're not elected. Any others? I want to go actually for, through those uh, point by point because you, you pretty much covered most of the bases. One of the biggest ones is voting. Voting. We are getting beat by white, by white evangelicals two to one yep. at the polls. Yep. Yes. Huge, huge gap. It's gotten better. I think the last election we went from, we went to, we got to 17%. If we voted proportion to our actual representation in, in the country, it would change the game completely. So one thing we tried to do to address this was um, in the last election, we partnered with a number of our member organizations uh, to do Secular America Votes, where we were getting local organizations to do voter registration in their states. And it wasn't just to, it was to try to fill this gap of, of, uh, of registration among the unaffiliated, but it wasn't just about that. It was also about visibility. We said to any group who was participating, we will send you free shirts, free buttons, free stickers, whatever it is, as long as you register voters visibly. Because a huge part of political influence for uh, candidates is which organizations, which movements are showing up and are part of voter registration. We know from the last election that voter registration played a huge part, especially for Democrats. I've been in the room with you know, uh, elected officials, members of Congress, talking about their races, and especially, you know, for example, Senator Cortez Masto, when she was talking about her race, it was voter registration, voter registration, voter registration. A place like Nevada, that's what really makes a difference. What that means is whatever organizations, nonprofits, local or national, that were working in Nevada to do voter registration, you'll bet they had a relationship with that campaign, or that they were on the radar of that campaign. And so doing voter registration isn't just about registering voters, of course it is, but it's also about getting on the map as a constituency that has ground game when it comes to our electoral system. And so I really, really encourage your congregations to get much more involved in voter registration, at not just at the national level, but also during state and local elections, because the more local you get, the more impact you can have. You need to do a little bit more work and you can get on the map, because so few people are involved. I don't have the magic answer of why we're not, we have this huge gap. I have a feeling it has to do with the same reasons that a lot of young people aren't voting because there's a big overlap there. Yeah. And the reason that someone who's unaffiliated isn't voting in California versus in Tennessee versus in Texas might be different, which is why you being on the ground registering voters and actually talking to them, you might be able to figure it out and get better every single cycle. So our vision is for local secular communities every single cycle to be involved in the voter registration process. Um, Paul Golan was talking about gathering data early today. That's something we need to do when it comes to voter registration because we don't have the answer, the, the silver bullet of why are we getting beat two to one. And it might be a different reason. It might be because it's in a particular state or county, it's just particularly complex to register. Or you know, when it comes to students, they're not sure if they should register here or from their home state. There's all kinds of reasons that people don't. Or maybe they're just disenfran they feel disenfranchised in some other way. So I definitely uh, encourage you to get involved in uh, voter registration. There was another, uh, someone else said, we're not organized. And not everyone who is unaffiliated yeah. is secular. 
I love that you brought up that point. That is true. When we say religiously unaffiliated, only about a third of them are, don't believe in God. The rest of them are everywhere from, ah, I'm not sure, sort of, to I do believe in God, but I'm not affiliated with a religion. So the religiously unaffiliated are not a monolith when it comes to beliefs and identities, but when it comes to the issues, we are more united than the evangelicals are, often by a 10 point difference on issues like same-sex marriage, evolution, whether they should be taught in schools, whether or not businesses should be able to discriminate on the basis of religion. You look at all of those issues, and we agree as a block, the unaffiliated, all of them, in higher numbers of the evangelicals. What's crazy about that is you think about the evangelicals and how lock and step they are with each other and how much influence they have, but they don't even agree as strongly with each other in as high numbers as we do, which means is that what brings that block together isn't identity. We're never gonna all call ourselves one thing. We're not all gonna have the same beliefs, but when it comes to the issues, we do. And that's what we have to emphasize, is the values and the issues that connect us. And Rachel alluded to this earlier, this is something we've been trying to do for a while now, is to connect the dots. That reproductive freedom is a secular issue. LGBT rights is a secular issue. Climate change is a secular issue. You have to bring it back to why it has to do with separation of church and state, because right now people are seeing those issues as siloed. And the problem also is that people, including religiously unaffiliated people, including a lot of young people who are motivated by the issues, those issues, they go to organizations that are working on those issues, but they're not coming to us. But one of the things, actually, the reasons that I joined the Secular Coalition for America five years ago is because I realized that I care about all these issues, and if I work on separation of church and state, I can tackle all of them at once. And that's a really compelling point, but a lot of people haven't connected those dots. And so if you're going back and talking about activism in your communities, one of the things I would recommend is thinking about the issues that you're going to be focusing on, how you're going to message those issues to people who, are, who care about them. You know, if, if, you, if there are communities, there are nonprofits, there are organizers in your communities who are working on that issue, reaching out and getting involved in it and communicating to them why it has to do with separation of church and state, why it has to do with humanistic Judaism, why it has to do with promoting evidence and science-based policy. So I wanted to show you some of the numbers. 74% of the religiously unaffiliated support abortion in all or most cases, while 61% of evangelicals oppose it. 85% of the religiously unaffiliated support same-sex marriage, while 59% of evangelicals oppose same-sex marriage. And finally, 83% of the religiously unaffiliated say that employers who have a religious objection to birth control should be required to provide it in health insurance plans for their employees. 53% of evangelicals say should they be able to refuse. So just imagine for a second that we were successful in connecting the dots for everybody so we could mobilize this block around the shared values and issues that we, that we care about and that we got them to vote. We will blow this political system out of the water and take back control because we already have the agreement, but people aren't looking at each other and realizing, oh, we all agree on these issues. This is the thing that brings us together. So. What can we do about it right now? So we talked about, I want to talk about our home district ground game, our, oh, I talked a little bit about Secular America Votes, um, and then I'll talk about the party organizing. So home district ground game, ground game, we want to be building relationships with lawmakers. They need to know who your communities are, who humanistic Jews are, and the issues that we're prioritizing. So the Secular Coalition, we're in DC, we're lobbying these offices regularly. We are building a rapid response network. And this is what I really love all of you to sign up for today. What you do is you go through one training with me on the, you know, all the nitty gritty details of preparing for and scheduling a meeting. So all of your members of Congress have a DC office. They also have home district offices. Who's, rep who's gone to their home district office for the member of Congress? A few of you. State is great too. I'm talking about federal, but state is great too. So what we're doing is we're building teams of constituents who are actually scheduling meetings and sitting down with either the member or their staff and building a relationship and talking about an issue. And you know, if, if you are signed up for action alerts, that's great, keep doing that. But just so you know, what action alerts do is they take all, the, all your information and they throw it into the web form on the website of the member of Congress. 
And that's really important when we have that in mass. The difference between that and rapid response is that when you have a meeting with somebody, you get their business card, then you follow up by email, you ha you're, not you're not submitting something through a web form, you're talking to a person directly. And the great thing is that when you follow up with them later on the issue, you could just reply to that last email that you had with them. And just think about the psychology of that in your inbox. You get all these emails, but then you, you're going to read one that, that shows up as a thread because that means you've talked to that person before, right? That's something I do is I, instead of starting a new email, if I can, I reply to the last one, even if it was months ago, so that they can see we've talked before. Mm -hmm. Especially if you've established that relationship face to face. They have a face to a name. That's a big part of this, is having that home district meeting so that you know Joe or Susan or whoever it is who works in that home district office. And I want to tell you about the relationship between the home district office and DC. The home district office is very important because remember, again, politicians are thinking about the next election. They're very interested in getting a sense of the pulse of the district, and the home district offices play a huge role in that. Pretty much every congressional office, it is somebody's job to um, scan or, or compile the letters to the editor of the local paper and send it to the DC office. Why? Because it gives them a sense of what the constituents are happy about, what they're not happy about, and what they care about. Because that's the kinds of things they need to respond to to stay in office. And so the home district office, when they have a meeting with you, they're reporting that back to the DC office. So when our home district people have, an, have a meeting, they report to me, then I follow up with the DC office and say, hey, I know that you met with these constituents last week and discussed X, Y, Z. would love to follow up with you and discuss this further. So you basically, by being a rapid responder, are a part of our team in DC and you make our lobbying stronger. You make the work that we do, we do go further because they know that we've got people at home that are voters in their district because so few people, so few people do this that the ones who do make, have a disproportionate amount of influence. And someone mentioned they're more organized. This is exactly the kind of stuff that they're doing. And the problem is that when you don't do this sort of thing, someone else is speaking for you if you don't speak for yourself. And we know that the opposition loves to talk about us and to demonize us. And they're shaping the narrative about who non theists are and what we stand for. We need to speak for ourselves. Because when you have that home district meeting, you might be the first humanistic Jew they've ever met. And you might have to explain what humanistic Judaism is, which is great. And every single time that you have a meeting or a phone call, it's not just about an issue. You always want to have some sort of ask. But every single opportunity, every single contact is an opportunity to educate them about our community and who we are, which is why whenever we give you a phone script or anything, part of it is, uh, my name is so-and-so, I'm from here, and I am a secular constituent, or I'm a humanistic Jewish constituent, whatever the fill-in-the-blank is. And then if they don't know what that is, you explain it to them. And after a while, that becomes something that hopefully their office just knows. We want to get to a point where we say, have you heard of the Secular Coalition or the, the Secular Community? They say, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've met with your constituents. We're familiar. What, what do you want to talk about today? That's the goal, to achieve that level of visibility. So I really hope you'll sign up for Rapid Response. Um, it's, it's so empowering. Every time, a lot of people get intimidated by the idea of doing this, but you're just talking to people. And also, you're a VIP when you walk into those offices because you're a voter, you're a constituent. They want to make a connection with you. And here's the other thing. It's not just about trying to get them to move on an issue. It's also about educating them. If you think about it, you know, no one person can know everything about absolutely every issue, right? So members of Congress, they have staff that, are, that have different portfolios. So you know, this person covers health and finance and military, and this person covers civil rights and um, tax policy. But even then, even though their staff is specializing, they still can't know everything. So they might have a few issues that they go really deep on, but they have to be very wide and shallow on everything else. That gives lobbyists and constituents who focus on specific issues a lot of power. Because the moment that you can um, and part of the relationship building is establishing yourself as a reliable subject matter expert, as a resource. Because after a while, if you are showing that you have integrity, that you have information they can use, they're going to start calling you. And that's what happens with us in DC. We have offices that call us to ask what the secular community might have on, it, on an issue or what we think about an issue because we've built that relationship and established that we can give them that information if it has to do with separation of church and state or religious freedom. Let me give you an example. Um, we were lobbying the DC Council to pass the Death of Dignity Act. 
uh, which would allow people who have a, a diagnosis of six months or less to live um, from a terminal illness to end their life on their own terms. I met with an office that the opposition had talked to them and they said, you know, we're concerned because um, you know, someone with diabetes could, could use this bill, which was false, a complete lie. And they hadn't read the bill. So they just kind of took it for granted, like, oh, okay, that's a concern we should consider when we vote. And then, of course, because I was there, I educated, I said, actually, that's not true. It's limited to people who are terminally ill and blah, 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 and gave them the information. I did two things. First of all, I gave them the correct information, but I also established that whoever they talk to is not a reliable resource. And they're probably never, ever going to listen to anything they have to say again because they were lied to. We, on the other hand, were a reliable resource with integrity. And that's the one thing you really, really have when you're lobbying or doing advocacy is your integrity. If you ever get asked a question in a meeting um, or at a town hall that you don't know the answer to, you say, I don't know, but I would love, I would be happy to follow up with you about that. And then you do. And that's a huge part of these district meetings is you follow up really quickly within the first day or two after your meeting and you kind of use it as an opportunity to sort of record what you talked about you know, written record of, it was so great to talk to you about XYZ, really appreciate that you committed to whatever they said they would do, pass it on to the DC office, or I'm glad that you think your boss would co-sponsor this bill. Um, but it's also an opportunity to follow up with any information that they asked for. You know, maybe they were really interested in learning more about the religious demographics of the state or the district, so you follow up with that. And you become a resource, a subject matter expert that they can trust, and someone that we can count on to pass on the information we're trying to pass to them in DC. There are things that are gonna happen in a meeting between constituents and a lawmaker or their staff that aren't gonna happen with me, the lobbyist. For example, Minnesota Five had a meeting with Congresswoman uh, Omar about a month ago in person. She called herself a humanist. Really? Yeah, now clearly she's a practicing Muslim but she was you know, willing to sort of adopt that and then sort of said it sort of in the context of like a humanist in her lawmaking. She never would have said that in a meeting with me. But with Minnesota humanists who are, you know, and constituents who she's trying to draw up connection with, she used their language. And now that's very helpful for me, the lobbyist, to know when I follow up with her office. So rapid response is how we're building our home district ground game. If we had constituents who are doing this reliably, and you don't have to do it a lot. You do one or two home district meetings a year. And in between, you're following up by email and phone calls with the actual person that you built a relationship with. We talked about electoral ground game about getting out the vote. Um, Engaging with candidates as well. So if, you, if you're paying attention to the campaign, see if they're gonna stop by your town and try to organize a group to go and ask them a question on the record and record it about an issue that you care about. I wanna talk about party organizing too. So um, Evelyn had mentioned that um, the Texas caucus was the first ever at the Texas Democratic Convention. We've gone a long way since then. First of all, that first time we did that, we had very little marketing that we had done. We had no idea how many people were gonna show up, but really what happened is people saw Secular Caucus on the program and they made a beeline for it. We had 300 plus people standing room only in that room for the first caucus. When we did it again last year, we asked the room to raise their hand if they were a person of faith and half the room raised their hands. People of faith coming to a Secular Caucus because they care so much about the separation of church and state. I want to talk about the, what, what this does. Why, why have a secular caucus? And, and this, is, this is different. I know, you know, caucus, it gets, it gets confusing. There's the Congressional Free Thought Caucus. That's legislators coming together to caucus. But these are people who are activists in their political party forming an internal interest group to move the party in a certain direction. With the Democratic Party, for example, you can almost guarantee you're going to have an LGBT caucus, a women's caucus. What do they do? They try to get the party to elevate women's issues or LGBT issues as a platform. They try to get the party to financially and publicly support women candidates and uh, LGBT candidates in the, in, the, in the party. Candidates get a lot of resources from the party. The party plays a big vetting role in the candidate pipeline. Someone had talked about representation, that we're not represented in government. This is one of the crucial ways that we can actually uh, influence that process directly in the candidate pipeline. Because it, the parties have such a huge influence on that. And especially when it comes to like the Democratic Party, for example, they're taking us for granted, the religious and affiliate, that we'll just vote their way. 
but what are they actually doing for us? Are they opening up the space for openly non-theistic candidates to run with the party's support? Not really. It's up to us to pressure them to do that. But it has to come from people on the inside. It's, a, it, it's sort of a transactional thing, right? Because the caucus, caucuses don't just push their interests, they also support the party because a party's interest is to elect more of their party to office. And that's why having people on the inside is so important. So what we want to do is, first of all, influence the platforms, make sure that, and for us, we're a nonpartisan organization. We'll work with secular Republicans, secular Greens, secular Democrats, secular Libertarians. As long as they want to promote separation of church and state, secular values, and make sure that non-theists have a place in their party, we will work with them, and we have. And what we want them to do, uh, what, what this can lead to, and I'm really excited about, is the Texas Secular Caucus is thinking about starting a PAC. Mm. What would happen if we had secular caucuses with PACs? We would have actual financial resources to support openly non-theistic and allied candidates running for office in their state. This is also, we talked about the platform. Um, one of the things that got into the 2016 Democratic Party platform through our activism was calling for removing the religious test for office that is still in the Texas state constitution. But that never would have even been on the radar for the Texas Democratic Party if it wasn't secular Democrats that were specifically calling that out. So it's through this in building these caucuses, these internal mechanisms to influence the platform, to elevate the issues we care about, and to educate them about our constituency because the parties have these strategic planning sessions and they talk about how are we going to reach the Catholics, how are we going to reach the Baptists, and how are we going to do this and that. They need to be educated about our constituency. What are you doing to fill the gap, that two to one, you know, to, to what, what resources are you putting into getting the religiously unaffiliated engaged? And also educating them about things like how to talk to secular constituents and how to make sure not to accidentally exclude them. We still see candidates across the political spectrum, including the Democratic Party, making mistakes, you know, saying things that conflate faith and patriotism, which excludes us. Um, saying things that would imply that they are better qualified because of their faith. It's one, and they, it, they can make very, very little changes to their rhetoric to make sure they're inclusive. You can say you're inspired by your faith to serve, but there's, there's a way to say that without implying that that makes you better qualified and therefore more qualified than a non-theist. These are very nuanced conversations. How are we going to get that message to the party through the caucuses? So my question uh, to you is, if you know, or my, I guess my challenge to you is if you are active in your party, whatever party it is, come talk to me. If you know somebody who is active in their party, because that's the ingredient that we need. These caucuses are actually not that difficult to organize and to get going. The hardest part is identifying the people who need to start them, which are people who are not just registered or affiliated with the party, but active in it. And that can mean they go to the state conventions. It can mean that they maybe serve on the local chapter of the party, on the committee. Or maybe they just go to the meetings regularly. So if you are one of those people or you know somebody who is, come talk to me. We can help you and we can network you with the other caucuses that are coming up across the country. All right, we talked about rapid response. We can keep going. Secular America Votes. We actually got covered by the Wall Street Journal. Ooh. Secular America Votes. That was pretty cool. Uh, we held 34 registration drives in 15 states in our first year, which is not, not bad for starting from scratch. And, oh, I want to, uh, no, so good. This is actually a picture of the 2018 um, secular, uh, the secular Caucus at the Texas Democratic Convention. You can see there's people all in the back, all on the sides, and they were sitting on the floor at the front. And what was really cool is we had organized to have five candidates speak to this group, but because there were candidates roaming around, they saw how full this room is, and we just had them coming in, coming in. Come, can I come talk to these people? Can I come talk? And they all, of course, made sure, because they know they're talking to a secular caucus, to talk about how much they support the separation of church and state and, and all of that, right? Think about that. Candidates running for office in Texas coming in saying, I want their votes. I'm going to talk to them about why they should vote for me. That's what these caucuses are doing. And then I really quickly want to pitch um, something else that we've started doing. So I mentioned that we don't build communities, we mobilize them. But something we realized is that a lot of the local communities are feeling very disconnected from each other. And that's not good for us because that makes it very difficult for us to mobilize them 
um, to take action. We did a, a pretty comprehensive needs assessment last year where we tried to get a snapshot of where grassroots organizing in the secular movement is. And we asked lots and lots of questions. We did a survey, we did informal interviews on the phone. And one thing that came up again and again, I, I asked two questions. I said, how connected does your local group feel to national organizations and how connected do they feel, do you feel to the groups around you in your area? And I was really, really shocked to see how bad uh, the responses were, and it was actually flipped. I thought they would say they felt more connected with their local groups than national, but it was actually the opposite. Reporting a lot of, uh, there was just a lot of people saying they felt very disconnected from their area. So something we did this year is uh, we funded three leadership summits in three different regions. And the summits were not conventions, they were basically like retreats for organizers in the same region to get together. Because the problem is we have conferences like this but they tend to be uh, for a specific niche, like this is for SHJ leadership, right, which is great. Um, or you ha even if they're more open, they're national in nature, so it's, it's expensive for people to go. So the people who probably need the most help as, as local groups are the least likely to attend those national conferences because it's so expensive to send people. And so what we wanted to do is to make it very, very localized, to be in a region and open to everybody, whether it's an ethical society, a humanistic Jewish group, an atheist group, a humanist group, an oasis, whatever it was, as long as they were secular and Americans United chapter, a Sunday assembly, whatever, and keeping it local so that it was not that expensive and people could actually drive to it. So we did three of them in March. We did Southern California, which actually has quite a bit of um, you know, religious areas. Uh, we did it in South, Greenville, South Carolina, and we worked with the Nashville Nuns Convention to add a Sunday program for organizers. Um, and it was phenomenal. A lot of these leaders, even though they're not, oh, I mean, in this area, which is more rural, they're actually pretty far from each other in terms of driving distance, but it's the first time a lot of them had met each other. And there were three main ingredients to this. One was skills building. We asked them, what do you need? Do you need fundraising training? Do you need social media training? Do you need help with your programs? Whatever it is, let's, let's focus on that. Um, and either bring in an expert or you can teach each other. The second thing was um, networking. We had built-in networking so people were actually bonding with each other. It was really funny. Someone at this summit said to me, you know, I've tried this before. I emailed all the meetup groups to try to get them to do something. I said, have they met you before? He said, no. It's like, well, you're a stranger to them, so of course they ignored your email. By the end of this, people were exchanging numbers, right? You know, they, they were adding each other on Facebook. We, we, we spent, this was the most successful one because it was overnight. It was an Airbnb that fit 26 people. Um, and we really, you know, the conversations during the day continued at night and people built friendships which means that they're much more likely to answer each other's emails and work with each other in the future. And all of the maybe ideas they might have had about what their groups represent or not fade away because they actually have a connection. And these are very, very different groups in the way that they organize and what they focus on. But of course, what do they all agree on? Getting more active and building political influence. And that was the third parameter that we had for funding was you have to come out of this with a shared advocacy agenda. You have to come out of this with a plan of how this region is going to strengthen itself with a united voice. And so um, we, we did three this year. We would really encourage groups like this one, like this temple, which has an actual space, to look outside of your doors at the other organizations in the state and in the region who might come to talk to you about how you can work more closely together. How many of you knew that there was an advocacy day in Lansing this week? Almost none of you. That's where I was on, uh, on Thursday. Center for Inquiry Michigan brought people together, scheduled meetings for them to meet with state legislators to oppose the, the anti-choice bills, the dismemberment stuff you know, that they're trying to pull, um, supporting bills that would repeal uh, Michigan's laws allowing discrimination on the basis of religion and dis in adoption and foster care agencies, and trying to get secular celebrants to be able to marry just like clergy advocating for that directly with state legislators and their staff. That's something that all of the groups in Michigan should have been a part of. Right? Sarah, oh, 25, minutes 25 minutes thank you. you yes, to thank you. Um, go to the next one. Oh, and we got some coverage from Religious News Service on, on those. Okay, that's pretty cool. Okay, and I do really quickly want to talk about values because, and this is something that Rachel had touched on. We, we realize as a lobbying organization, we have this great resource, it's called the Model Secular Policy Guide. It's every single issue that we take a position on, what our policy recommendation is, um, and the audience, the primary audience is lawmakers. 
you know, here's a perfect secular America, the manual to a perfect secular America. But it's, but it's full of, you know, kind of legalistic and, you know, jargon. Uh, and it's all about the issues. And to that, to that issue of, okay, not all the religiously unaffiliated are secular, we wanted to think of what's a way that we can talk about the issues we care about, connect those dots for people, and bring everyone from the non-theist to the I have faith but I'm not affiliated, and our faith allies on board. And we challenged ourselves to boil down the issues in our policy guide to values. The, the why, like why do we take this position? Why does this matter to the secular community? And I'm not saying these are the values that you should use, I'm just you know, this is what we're using because it, it allows us to talk about our issues. So we finally came up with these four values, freedom, inclusion, equality, and knowledge. And they're not just empty words that we like, we define them in very specific ways to allow us to talk about any of the issues that we work on. So go ahead. Um, here's an example with freedom. Beliefs protected, not imposed. Very simple, four words, and almost every American would agree with that because no one likes the idea of beliefs being imposed on them. Here's an example of how we might use it in messaging. I support patients' rights. Stop there. Who is going to disagree with that? Everyone's been a patient. When it comes to your healthcare decisions, the only beliefs that matter are yours. We haven't mentioned religion yet. We haven't mentioned separation of church and state. We've said things that most people will agree with. Then, a medical provider's religion shouldn't prevent patients from accessing care. Freedom, beliefs protected, not imposed. Again, we can workshop this. It's probably not the perfect words, but the, the idea here is to lead with something that people will agree with. I actually learned this in sales. I had this awful summer job in Home Depot where I was you know, trying to get people to sign up for cabinet refacing. <laughs> it was great training. And one of the things they taught me to say is, I'm sure you're gonna update your kitchen sometime in the next 10 years, right? And they would magically start shaking their head, yes, almost every time. So you start with something that, is, that people agree with and that's a little bit disarming. And then, but you, imagine if we had flipped that. Imagine if we had led with saying, a medical provider's religion shouldn't prevent patients from accessing care. People start making all kinds of assumptions about where you're coming from and what you're about to say, even though they probably would have agreed with you if you had started the, the um, pitch differently. Inclusion, all faiths and none. Again, really, really simple. And, and uh, to give you some examples also of how we're tying these to issues, with the freedom one, protecting beliefs, not imposing them, we can use that to talk about everything from proselytizing the military to abortion and birth control rights to um, students being forced to say the Pledge of Allegiance. There are a million different medical aid and dying, totally, completely different issues from each other, but all that we can explain with beliefs protected, not imposed. Inclusion, all faiths and none. We can use it to talk about religious displays on government property. We can use it to talk about in God we trust and under God and the pledge. We can use it to talk about um, how the Boy Scouts shouldn't have a religious test for scouting. Go ahead. I have to say, when I saw this poster at the rally we got together and I didn't like it because it crosses <laughs> out, I'm thinking it ought to funnel into it. Right, right, you know, yeah, yeah. Was, Good feedback. Good feedback. Out. Atheist, Christ, I'm Jewish, and here I am. You know. <laughs> so here's, here's, here's an example of how we might talk about inclusion. I support one nation indivisible. Notice the subliminal message, because under God is not there. Every American, no matter who they are and what they believe, should feel included in our national symbols and traditions. Again, you know, very few people would say, no, I don't agree. There are people who shouldn't be part of it. In a secular country, patriotism has no religion. Inclusion, all faiths and none. Again, maybe you don't like exactly how this is worded, but the, but the, the tool is there of you support this thing that very few people disagree with and you bring it back to the issue and the value, which is inclusion. Next one is equality. This one was hard because we had to be able to talk about both equality in terms of rights, like you shouldn't be discriminated against, but also um, responsibilities, like you shouldn't be exempt from public health and safety laws that apply to everybody else which is why we came up with unbiased governance, that if the government is going to protect people, they should protect everyone equally. And if they're going to say that this is a compelling government interest, say everyone being vaccinated um, or preventing child abuse and neglect, that there shouldn't be any exemptions for that based on religion. Child abuse is child abuse, whether it's for a religious reason or not. So here's an example of that. Um, next one, thank you. I support all families. Who's gonna disagree? Families might look different, but love is universal. 
Adoption of foster care agencies receiving taxpayer funding shouldn't be allowed to discriminate equality on biased governance. So what I would encourage you to do when you go back to your communities and think about activism, a huge part of activism is having the right message and explaining what it is that you believe in a compelling way that might convince a lawmaker to support you. Or even if they're not gonna agree with you, I, it's really funny, I go to red areas and they say, oh, I shouldn't contact my member of Congress because they're never gonna agree with me. And then I go to blue areas and say, oh, my member of Congress is great on our issues, I don't need to contact them. <laughs> In the red areas, I say, well, first of all, lobbying is a long game, and the first step is visibility. They need to know that there's a constituency that is consistently mad at them. <laughs> and also, there are things that you might not see. They might not support your legislation, but maybe they, you know, if they get 50 phone calls and they're, you're using up their time every single time they do something stupid, maybe next time, you know, Alec comes over and says, hey, will you introduce this? I'll say, you know what, I don't want to get all of that flack and, and public shaming from my atheist constituents. I have better things to do, not this time. And you'll never know about that. And at the very least, you know, if, if they, having that visibility and being on the map is a success in, in itself. So you know, actually, one of my favorite meetings that I had during the 100-day pledge was with um, uh, the senator from Missouri's office. And the guy who was literally hired as the faith guy for the office, he was so excited to meet with me. You know, he's just very, he was, you know, he didn't agree with anything I had to say, anything I had to say. But he actually said to me, he said, you know, I think if we had more conversations like this, our country would be better. With you, Republican or Democrat? Republican. Republican. Okay, and, and you know what I could get him to agree on? Non-theists in the military. The atheists and foxholes was the, was the issue I chose to talk about, and that's something that we could agree on, is that atheists and foxholes should have equal access to, to services. Um, where was I going with that? I'll think of it. Next one. Oh, and then the last one is knowledge. Information and powers. Very, very simple concept, but we can use it to talk about climate change. We can use it to talk about why curriculum in public schools should be secular. We can use it to talk about why it's not okay for the government to be funding crisis pregnancy centers, and so on. Because we can say, just as a general concept, when society and people have all the possible, best possible information, most medically accurate, most scientifically accurate, we're all better as a result. Go ahead, use an example. I support education. Who doesn't? Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Education should focus on empowering students, not pushing an agenda. Now, a lot of people would read that, and they're just going to think of the agenda they don't like. Mm -hmm. We haven't said which agenda we don't like yet. <laughs> Nobody likes the idea of someone pushing an agenda on their kids. Then, public schools must teach a secular curriculum based on, based on evidence and science, knowledge, information, and powers. Again, imagine you had flipped that and just started with teaching a secular curriculum. People don't know what secular means, and they're just having all these assumptions, but you've gotten a lot of people uh, just uh, up to the second sentence. A lot of people have agreed with you. Okay. So actions you can take today, and then we're going to move on to Q&A after this. Um, and if we do have time, what I'd love to do is break you up into groups by region so we can talk about advocacy in your areas. So you can donate to support our work, secular.org slash donate. I also have donation forms with us. You can sign up for action alerts on our website, um, on the clipboard that I have with me, um, and you can also text the word secular to 52886 and get text messages. Um, sign up to be a rapid responder. On our clipboard, you can fill out your name and then there's a la last column that says rapid response and you just put yes if you would like to be a representative of your congressional district. And again, if you are active in your political party or you know someone who is, who might be interested in starting a caucus, come talk to me. Again, you can text secular to 52886. And I think the last one is just my contact information. All right, and with that, I'll take questions. Thank you so much. Uh, a couple things. Is there a single clip of sessions, multiple responses to, to your question? That's one question. Hmm. I live in Minnesota 5, by the way. Excellent. You should join your rapid yeah, response team. Oh, don't, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> you know, like when you say, we, have common, we should have common ground with every single person in government on the, on the basis that everyone signed, swears an oath on a constitution that is secular. So even a Republican ought to support secular governance because, say, the uh, First Amendment protects their rights. It's administered by a secular government, and it protects their rights as much as it protects others. So that's what I want. As far as the video clips, I, I think that one with that you saw must yeah. be somewhere. 
Um, I think we also should have clips of the senators asking the question of him. Yeah, um, well, I somewhere. wanted to edit it into a single package that could be sent. Uh, yeah. I, I'll have to look into that. Just yeah, email me. And, you. Yeah. You. Um, you talk about a lot of your strategy and goals towards trying to ensure that because the representative is looking for uh, trying to meet the next election, do you see a challenge with the movement to try and have term limits being imposed on Congress people? Uh, is it, I guess the question was, does, uh, does, does advocating for term limits run against what we're trying to do? I, I don't think so. Well, because, no, was that not your question? No, it, I mean, it's not whether you're opposed or not, but how it changes your tactics as a result. Because if you're trying to get them to say, we have to keep people ready because they're constantly trying to be elected, but if they don't have that uh, pressure on them anymore, mm -hmm. then why? Well, I think, you know, there's not a whole lot you can do if they're in their last term. You know, if they, we do have term limits and it's their last one, up until then they are still running, right? I, I think then you can stress legacy. You know, what is it that you want to stand for? Right. Um, but we're not there yet with term limits. And, and the thing is, uh, we should be in every single cycle engaged, uh, no matter what. So, yes, is a lame duck you know, a challenge? Yes. Uh, and then I would just try to appeal to their ego a little bit with their legacy. <laughs> Yeah, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, uh, very much for helping, helping us in Connecticut. Well, first of all, uh, they run an annual lobby day in Washington, D.C. If you haven't gone to it, it's fantastic because you don't have to, they do all the prep for you. They get the appointments for you. They show you the issues. They give you a position statement. They get you in the door. And you can either talk from the material, or show the material, or talk from something else that you personally believe you want to connect with. It's just a fantastic experience. If you haven't done it, you ought to do it. Especially, the further you live away from Washington, the more significant it is that you're actually showing up at their office. Mm -hmm. And of course, take an extra couple of days to visit the Smithsonian. It's fantastic. <laughs> um, and it's, you know, it's right and it's the next block over. The second thing, you see she's wearing a symbol that says, Secretary Values Voter. <laughs> well, I asked her if she would send me a bunch of those. So she had, when I get home, I'm gonna look at my mailbox, because uh, on Wednesday, there's a march at our state capitol, and I'm gonna be distributing them to all yes. our secular people who are gonna participate in that march, which happens to be a women's reproductive uh, rights march something we're totally in agreement with, and we want to show people that there's secular people in the state who don't want interference by religious bodies, and uh, so thank you so much. Thank you, Terry. Terry has been a longtime supporter and advocate of the Secular Coalition, and we've worked with the Secular Coalition for Connecticut to have a briefing with, their, with Governor Malloy, where he met with all the local leaders of the secular group, so that's something also if you build a strong regional uh, cohort, you can do those sorts of things together and it's much more powerful when you're in it together. I mean, the governor got not just the issues that they were talking about, but also every group name and how many members they had and in what district they were located. Um, they also um, were able at their advocacy day a few years ago to introduce legislation, um, you know, authored, you know, promoted specifically by the secular community, which is pretty fantastic. So when you get together and get, get involved in the advocacy, especially at the state and local level, states get a lot more done than Congress does. And the lawmakers are a lot more accessible, so there's a lot you can do. Our lobby day, we haven't announced a date yet, but it'll probably be in late September. So just stay tuned and sign up for our, our mailing list and you'll hear about that. There's one more thing you said that um, kind of inspired a comment that I can't remember now, um, but I'll, I'll think about it later. Stickers, yes, actually, thank you, that was exactly it. So yeah, I'm happy to send you stickers and buttons. We have some as well. And the reason, I forgot to mention this, why is it secular values voter, not secular voter? People get very confused about what secular means and it sort of depends what you're describing. Secular values voter, you're describing the values. So a Christian could say, I'm a secular values voter because they have secular values that connect to all those issues we talked about. Right. A Muslim could be a secular values voter. An atheist can be a secular values voter. But if a Christian is trying to call themselves a secular voter, it's like, well, does that mean I support separation of church and state or am I saying I'm secular because I'm Christian? We sidestep the whole issue <laughs> by saying secular values voter. So that's why it's called that. And all of our Minnesota Five people who met with Omar, they took a picture with her and they're all wearing the secular values voter buttons in that picture. Is she wearing it too? No. But she's a humanist, right? <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so she says, you, you, and then you.
Well, just another plug I want to put in is um, the Secular Student Alliance is really good at helping students at any given college or university, or in my case, I was the advisor for community college, get started and bring a speaker, and more and more, they've got high schools. So we've had some pretty excited high school kids who said, oh, we'll start a chapter, and it's a really good thing to do, right? Mm -hmm. Because those kids often get visibility mm -hmm. because of like, oh my god, high school kids. They also have access to facilities on yeah. the college campuses that we should really be taking advantage of. Good one. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Sarah is a veteran of the secular. I am. I'm an alum Alliance. of the American University Secular Student Alliance. Yeah. Right. yeah. Right. Who's the second person? I know, right? Hi. Thank you very much. Um, David Cohn from Baltimore, originally New York. Um, first, now you talk about your relation, and I'm in the Ethical Society too, which. Oh, it's great. also a constituent group, but hey, since this is the humanistic Jewish group, what's, and I just got two questions, A, what's your relationship with other Jewish groups? Hopefully, God, God will, you know, offense, they, they have a good relationship. I think somebody asked um, Ms. Lazar about the Orthodox, because maybe it's not just the Christian right, mm -hmm. but the Orthodox right, and second, which may be a little off topic, um, I think Mayor Pete, you know, running for president, mm -hmm. he, he's Catholic, but he talks about the religious left. Like he's saying, you know, I'm not Christian, he's saying, you know, Jesus didn't say, let's, you know, kill the Jews, as, or let's kill the Jews at the rapture stuff. Um, which maybe talk about the religious left, you know, et cetera. So we talk about maybe the relationship with other Jewish communities and even the Orthodox. Sure. So there's, there's a lot of coalitions, um, you know, not like ours that have voting members, but you know, ad hoc coalitions that form in DC around issue areas. Uh, so for example, there's the National Coalition for Public Education, and it's a bunch of education groups, but it's also secular groups and religious groups. And the whole point of that coalition is opposing vouchers and all voucher-like schemes, period. So every time something comes up in federal legislation that's a voucher scheme, all of these organizations that have organized around this purpose work together on that. So there's a number of coalitions like that that we're a part of that include our faith allies and that include Jewish progressive uh, Jewish organizations like um, the Religious Action Center or Bend the Ark um, and groups like that. Um, so we, we work with them in those capacities whenever there's an issue that's bringing us together. Uh, we have a really close relationship with the Interfaith Alliance and the um, Catholics for Choice. Uh, in particular. Um, we worked a lot with them and the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty on the Johnson Amendment. The Johnson Amendment Coalition was really impressive. It was faith groups, it was secular groups, but it was also like, you know, groups that are watchdogs on tax policy, it was National Council of Nonprofits, huge coalition. So the answer is yes, we do work with those Jewish groups. Um, you know, the, B, the Mayor Pete, Pete Buttigieg is, um, we, we've been talking about, um, we're starting to track candidate remarks on, on our issues and on uh, non-theists generally. Um, I feel like, uh, and, and we're actually starting to think about writing some sort of op-ed or blog post about this because they're, the intentions are good, but a lot of the candidates are just missing the mark on things because the problem is, you know, you can agree on the conclusion on, you know, say his policy proposals, but to basically say, well, Trump isn't a Christian and my version of Christianity is the right one is not a place we want to be because we don't want our candidates to be the arbiters of religion, whether we agree with their conclusions or not. And that's where the nuance is really important. You know, it would be great if he would go ahead and say, you know, I, I'm inspired by my faith uh, to have these positions, but to basically s claim ownership of the correct interpretation of what Jesus would do is, is not what we want candidates to do. I disagree, because isn't that what the Christian right does? And even I hate to say as a Jew, the Orthodox, like, you know, the Christian right. I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm not a Christian, but I don't think Jesus said, let's beat up the gays or let's beat up the Jews. And that's what, you know, like the rap, if you're familiar with that, or beating up and killing the gays. I mean, right. I don't think Jesus but you can that. say that and say, my interpretation and all of these other folks interpret it this way, and we're not really sure how you came to your conclusion given X, Y, Z. But, to, but that's a different statement than saying, that's not what Jesus represented, because I am the correct inter, you know, arbiter of this religion. Because if we're going to advocate authentically for separation of church and state, 
we need to really draw that line and not make an exception when we happen to like the conclusions that they reached. And I, I think it's great that he wants a revival of the religious left because those are our allies. Um, but we want to make sure that we're not thrown under the bus in the process, that we're included in that. No, no, that's okay. You, are you? Uh, so I want to go back to what you said about non-voters and how that's, that's really the biggest issue to getting candidates that we would want in there. And a lot of it is apathy, which is it's really, really difficult to mobilize people that are just totally apathetic, totally disillusioned with the entire process. But there's also the, real, the very real problem of access. And you know, having voting day on a Tuesday, and, you know, during certain hours, and when people are working, and you know, restricting. And I live in Texas, so we know all about restrictive voter ID laws and you know, barriers to you know, closing DMVs, point access. And, and you mentioned your points of contact with Congress, working with the Secular Coalition. Is is there is there you know proactive legislation happening with you know restrictive access to voting? We don't work on that issue specifically because we're confined to separation of church and state issues. And even that is like our policy guide is like 40 pages and we can't even lobby on all those things. But I would definitely encourage you to work with you know, local nonprofits and other organizations that are working toward that because it's a really root cause issue. Um, our, our voter registers, uh, voter registration teams in Texas were the most active in the country during, during Secular America votes. They registered hundreds of voters, especially in Houston and students in particular. Um, what I would love to see is for Second America Votes to develop into a more sophisticated, not just voter registration, but get out the vote to help with those accessibility issues. So there's kind of like two parallel things we need to do. We need to get involved um, in the issues that, uh, issues like that of like, how can we make voting more accessible? Um, that's not something we're working on, but I know that it might be something that humanists can work on, right? So that's kind of the dif difference there's humanism. You can cover anything. <laughs> Secularism is more specific to just governance, not just you know um, social progress. Um, but at the same time, dealing with the current restrictions, what can we do to help people get to the polls? Okay. The programs that you're talking about, ongoing programs, I think are uh, very to the point and hopefully they will be successful. But I'm interested in finding out if you are looking at doing anything in addition to that um, in advance of the upcoming 2020 election. Yes, that's a great question. So for party organizing in particular, uh, we would really love to see a national secular caucus in the National Democratic Party. Um, and in 2016, we did a reception for secular Democrats. We're probably gonna do that again in 2020, and we'd like it to be a lot larger. Um, so we're right now trying to identify people who are secular and who are going to be delegates and alternates to the convention um, so that we can hopefully influence the platform of the 2020 convention there. Um, so that that's part of that um, the candidate pipeline as well, you know, and and you know all of the programs You know really if if they're if they're strong the time to really activate our rapid responders and our party Organizers and people doing voter registration is around elections um, So it's not like the tactics really change the only thing there there are things that we're doing like uh, we're preparing our questionnaire to send to all the presidential candidates um, that's something that we're doing um, and we'll make that available so that folks can go to their campaign events and ask those questions on the record. Um, but again, I think it's really important to have these regional, uh, uh, to have the groups well connected to each other because for example, if a candidate's gonna come to your state and they're gonna stop at all these places, we need all the local groups to be coordinating so we can get as many people as possible wearing something that identifies them as sec secular constituency to get on the cameras with their signs and be seen as a constituency that's showing up to these rallies and hopefully if you have the opportunity to record them answering a question. So that all comes back to what is our capacity on the ground to work together and to respond to these opportunities. Thank you so much.